forming in, in uh, rivers and river floodplains, and we start finding some really interesting land plants. Now, this is the inner core of a uh, horsetail rush. Some of these horsetail rushes got up to 90 feet high and about 8 inches, 9 inches around. This is just a very tiny, this one is about uh, an inch and a half across because it's just the inner part of it. We think that land plants, um, the best evidence we have for them is that they evolved uh, uh, back in the Silurian period, but there's really interesting evidence in Grand Canyon. There's a fellow back east, and I completely lost his name, but he's found what he believes are land plant spores in the Bright Angel Shale, as far back as the Cambrian. If that's true, then we have the earliest land plants anywhere yet known on the planet, which is kind of interesting. By this time, by the Pennsylvania, the land plants are called big guns. There's another one of these um, horsetails with some of the uh, foliage on the sides. And the kind of environment that we think that these things, uh, these plants grew in, um, we have the mountain range further to the uh, further to the east. This is actually a picture from uh, would have been a picture sort of from from the uh, closer to this mountain range. So kind of move those mountains further back for Grand Canyon. But you have these tall, weird-looking creatures called scale trees, um, Lepidodendron, and their closest living relative today is a club moss, which is easy, really, really small. And um, then these horse tails growing down on the, the lowlands, you find ferns, you find even some early conifers, really, really wild stuff. Now, if you go further to the east, remember that big ocean basin we talked about, Paradox Basin, over there in western, southwestern Colorado, southeastern Utah. In that basin accumulated many, many hundreds of feet of limestone interlayered with salt and gypsum. As the basin periodically got cut off from fresh water coming in, things would begin to dry up and evaporate, and you start accumulating big layers of salt and gypsum. This is on the San Juan River in um, southeastern Utah. The other thing that started that uh, happened at the edges of this basin were that you started getting growth of algae. Now these algae, it's really wild stuff. It kind of looks like a head of lettuce with these little layers growing on top of each other and forming in these big piles. They would form a huge, uh, well, you kind of call it a reef with quotation marks around. It's called bioherm. And this is the outline of one of these bioherms, this sort of wavy line. This is on the San Juan River again. And you, find, you see these in quite a few places. This is a picture of that Wayne Randy uh, lent me. And why am I telling you about algal bioherms and the piles of lettuce and who really cares? Well, the interesting thing is as these, uh, this type of algae began to die, um, and under the pressure of burial, the pressure of more and more sediment being uh, piled on top of it, it began to alter into oil. And the oil moved through the, the pore spaces in this bioherm, and we find substantial deposits of oil in the Paradox Basin. And there's even places on the San Juan River where you can see the stuff leaking out of the walls. It's really, really interesting. So there are many fossils in, in these layers of limestone that I uh, showed you on the San Juan River. We find brachiopods, we find sponges, we find corals. But these are probably some of the most interesting and certainly economically significant. Now, about 200 and, let's say, uh, 60 million years ago, in the Permian period, we start to see some really interesting changes in the landscape of the Colorado Plateau, and I will explain why that happens. But notice how much more land there is on the Colorado Plateau. The uh, uh, Paradox Basin is, is completely filled in, and the edge of the sea is over here in western Arizona and then over in central Utah. And you start to see some very interesting things going on now. Permian rocks in the Colorado Plateau exist all around here. The Kaibab Formation is probably the most famous one that, that we would know of. Over in the Canyonlands region, again, the San Rafael Swell, um, uh, and, and, I just completely lost it. South of Gallup over here, and what the heck is this? <laughs> oh, Canyon Shit. Sorry. <laughs> I, just, I just completely lost that for a second. Um, but the Permian represents go back again. Notice how many different environments there are in, in the Permian. We have uh, uplands, we have lowlands, we have coastal regions, and we have shallow green. And we start to see all of that in different parts of the Colorado Plateau. 
Now, one of the reasons that things started to change so much in the Permian is that by the end of the Permian, all of the continents, and again, they're showing you pretty much the modern outlines, just to give you an idea, but all the continents had assembled into one giant supercontinent. Well, that's not just kind of cool for people who want to hike all the way from Arizona across <laughs> the continent. Um, or, you know, sail, when you talk about sailing around the world, got an ocean that goes all the way around. But it's really going to change the climate of things. Back in Pennsylvania and back in the Mississippi, and things were very much more tropical, they were very wet. Well, once you take all these continents and you assemble them all together, you are going to change the climate, Earth's climate or, or, or the land's climate, tremendously. And you start to see uh, more drying out, more seasonal um, variations in temperature, and the creatures and plants that start to evolve during this time or appear during this time reflect this. So the Permian rocks that, uh, some of the Permian rocks that we, we know of um, are around Canyonlands National Park. This is along the, the, Santa, uh, the Colorado River near the LaSalle Mountains near Moab. All of Canyonlands um, along the San Juan River here, uh, along the uh, Lime Ridge anticline there. And there are Permian rocks, uh, these beautiful, all these sort of red, gorgeous red, Monument Valley, all these areas. Um, our Permian rocks. And we start finding some really interesting creatures now. What's happened during this intervening time period between the Mississippi and the Permian? Well, we talked about those critters moving up and out of, up and on the land, going from fish to amphibians. Well, reptiles are the next step. And as the climate begins to dry, it begins to get more seasonal variation, less water availability. Any critter that had leathery skin, so it can prevent itself from, from drying out, and had a leathery egg or a hard-shelled egg so that its eggs wouldn't dry out, was going to have a big advantage over some of those amphibians. So they can take advantage of all those niches away from water. And we start seeing creatures in the Permian, uh, around Canyonlands region, Monument Valley region. Um, these guys here, this is Edathosaurus. This is Dimetrodon, this is Ophiacodon here, and Sphenacodon, so I like saying these names because they're so cool. These guys are um, from a group of reptiles called the sailfin reptiles. And believe it or not, these guys are related very distantly to one of the reptiles that went on to become mammals. Not these guys, but they're related. Um, these big sailfins, I can't remember if I threw a picture in there. No, I guess I'll do it. These big uh, sails, supported a skin, a long elongated vertebrae supported a skin fold here. And they think that they were used for thermal regulation, that is for regulating their body temperature. So they turned sideways to the sun if they needed uh, to warm up in the morning, and then they turned into the sun if they needed to cool down. This is one possibility. They could have also turned really bright colors and, you know, hey, baby, check me out when they're looking for a mate. Like <laughs> but you can see these guys here, Dinetrodon, Spinacodon, these guys are predators. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it says about herbivores or vegetarians. They have very small heads. So this guy, um, Edaphosaurus, was a, was a uh, vegetarian there. Um, now, some other interesting critters. And this is a little guy called Seymouria. He's, he's an amphibian, but he's a more terrestrially adapted amphibian. Again, indicating that anything that could take advantage of some more uh, you know, uplands and get away from the water at times is going to have an advantage in these times. This particular fossil is from Texas, but they have found Seymouria in your Moab um, on the Colorado Plateau. And then, probably this, the most common amphibian during this time was this huge guy called Ariops. And um, he had this big, long head that took up about a quarter of the length of his body, or a third of the length of his body, and uh, sort of went on to uh, uh, give rise to some of the larger amphibians I'll show you when we get into the Mesozoic. In the Grand Canyon region, we also find some of these red rocks. This is the Hermit Shale, and a little dory going through Snow Creek Rapid. Um, <laughs> But the hermit shale was, it was uh, formed in those rivers that were coming off those mountains, out onto the flatlands, out onto the coastal plain, and onto the floodplains. And we find some beautiful uh, fern impressions from these, uh, from this, as well as uh, amphibian or reptile tracks and, and uh, other types of plants. Now, um, as the Permian continues, this next layer here in Grand Canyon, the Coconino Sandstone, is a really good indication of a dry 